Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Geographic Society of Chicago's February Travel Log. I'm Judy Prophet from the GSC office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the webinar, time permitting. If this is your first time attending a GSC event, welcome and thank you for tuning in. The Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses since 1898. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technologies through services such as our geospatial technology programs we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS or geographic information systems to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide education opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic material collections in educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies and problem solving, and much, much more. Today's travel log presenter is Jean Flynn, Jean will share his personal experiences and explore the history behind the Netherlands and Belgium. Jean, thank you so much for being with us today and presenting on the Netherlands and Belgium. Well, th thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be returning to the Geographical Society to uh, talk about a trip uh, that Mary and I took in 2019. And it was visiting the Netherlands and Belgium on a river cruise. Uh, so, uh, so here is uh, just a little highlight. Uh, we're going to be talking about the sea, the, the geography of this area, the uh, windmills, the tulips, and as well as art. So uh, it's a wonderful part of Europe to visit. Uh, to uh, put it into you know, broad context, here is a map of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands. And this is a map uh, that was created when this country was created in 1815. So after uh, the British and the uh, Prussians defeated Napoleon, uh, the, the powers to be in Europe got together and they, they created this country. Uh, so the Netherlands and uh, Holland had previously existed, but they created this as a unified country. And eventually, and we'll talk about that in a bit, the northern provinces became the Netherlands, and the southern provinces became Belgium. And down at the lower right, we have Luxembourg. So, so what was a United Kingdom lasted only 15 years uh, before they started to split into uh, split into two, and eventually into three. And uh, uh, and this area, we we often use the term well Holland. Uh, but Holland is actually not the country, that's one of the provinces of the Netherlands. And, uh, and the Netherlands today has 17 million people, Belgium has 12 million. And, uh, but, they're, the, but these populations are living on a relatively small footprint. So the Netherlands, uh, it's about, the, the Netherlands is about one fourth the size of Illinois and yet they have 50% more population than Illinois. Illinois has 13 million, the Netherlands has 18 million, and Belgium is, is only one fifth the size of Illinois, and they have about the same number of people as Illinois. So, so, so the density and population and urbanization is uh, very, very extensive. Now, these, this land here is called the Low Countries. And it's, and it's because the low countries, because much of the land is actually under sea level. And it's under sea level and, the, and they have dikes and large mounds of land holding the, the North Sea uh, away from the land. And, and the actual North Sea is often six to nine feet higher than the land that people are farming. And so, you know, keeping the water at bay is very, very important. But these, this land, and particularly the northern part, the Netherlands part, they've been flooding for millions of years. And there's a legend in the Netherlands called the Kinderdijk legend. And, and the legend is that 
uh, thousands of years ago, 10 or 15,000 years ago, there was a massive flood from the North Sea, wiped out many people and farms, and the people that survived were standing on the shoreline uh, that what was left and uh, you know, just trying to think, how do they rebuild their lives? And what did they see floating on the water but a, uh, a cradle uh, with a child and a cat that was rocking the cradle to keep it from tipping over? And, uh, and who knows if this is a true story or not? It, it may, but, but the purpose of the story or the, the legend shows that the people in the Netherlands, even though with these disasters that reoccur, that they work together, they look to the future, and they work together to, uh, to look after each other. So the Kinderdijk legend speaks for the type of people that live here. So I wanted to cover just a, a little bit of history, uh, you know, four minutes of history, because it's important, I think, to understand the history as well as the geography of a region to understand what we see today when we visit. But back in the 1500s, the Netherlands were part of Spain. And uh, the uh, King Charles of Spain ruled the Netherlands as well as all of Spain. Uh, and even at this time, there was growing unrest because of the population was largely adopting the religious beliefs of the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, in 1568, uh, the provinces in, uh, to, uh, of Netherlands wanted their independence, and they started an 80-year war of independence against Spain uh, and the Spanish army. And it wasn't fighting for all 80 years. Some years, there was no fighting at all. Other years, it was intense fighting. So it, it kind of ebbed and flowed, but they did achieve their independence after 80 years. Uh, and in 1587, Amsterdam decided to switch from Catholicism, the, the Catholic, to the Protestant churches. And so, uh, and our tour guide said that over a weekend, they decided, they, they declared that this coming Sunday, we will be practicing Protestantism. And so they, they took out all the statues, the stained glass windows disappeared, and they, uh, they whitewashed the walls, even to this day, when you go into a major church, it's, it's very stark. There's no paintings. There's a, it's, it's white wall, white walls. And they did have tolerance for those that wanted to remain Catholic. So they said to those people, you can practice your faith, but you cannot have a church. But if you want to meet for mass at a, a, a hall, that's okay. Do it quietly and we'll, we'll get along. So, so there was tolerance but there was still some limited trust between the two religions. Uh, in the 1600s, uh, the Netherlands uh, were, became a world trading hub. Uh, they, uh, their, their sailors and their uh, owners got to the, what we call Indonesia today. They were called the Spice Islands back then. And uh, so they became traders. Their ships rounded the Southern coast of Africa they got to Indonesia, and they bring back cinnamon and nutmeg. Uh, and to this day, there's very spicy foods in, in Amsterdam as part of that trend. Uh, but, it, but the ships that went to, the nether, to Indonesia, a third of them never came back. They, they were lost at sea. And, uh, and you can imagine if the painting on the lower left this is, shows a ship that's heading to uh, Indonesia. And that same tower is sitting there today in Amsterdam. And you can imagine the families that were putting their young, you know, all their sailors on board, but particularly the, the families that might be sending their 10 or 11 year old son to become a naval trainee, putting them on the ship and wondering, will we ever see this boy again? It uh, had to be very, very emotional. Uh, uh, Amsterdam at this time period uh, became a strong merchant center for this trade. And uh, here we have a painting by Rembrandt shows the, it's called the painting is called the Night Watch. And it's an enormous painting uh, and uh, by uh, it's 12 feet high by 14 feet wide. And each of the men portrayed here were, were members of the Night Watch. 
And 10 years earlier, they were patrolling the streets of Amsterdam to uh, protect Amsterdam and to be on the lookout uh, for uh, if there was some Spanish armies coming. By this point, it was more of a ceremonial position. They got together and uh, talked about the good old times. Notice in the middle, uh, there is a, a, a picture of a painting of a woman. Uh, and there's actually a chicken on her belt. And art historians speculate that this might have been Rembrandt's wife as, a, as the painting of the face. And they have no idea why she has a chicken on her belt. But, the, but Rembrandt inserted that in the middle of this painting. Uh, interestingly enough, every person portrayed here paid the same amount of money to have their picture, their, the image of their face in the picture. And some, you see a great deal of them. Others, you just see a, a tiny fraction of their face. But apparently, they were all happy. Uh, in the 1600s, uh, tulips became very popular in the Netherlands. And tulips originally came from Turkey. Uh, but they were prized in the Netherlands and the rich, moist soil were ideal for growing tulips. And uh, the tulips became traded on a stock exchange. And if you had a rare tulip, you might sell it for $100 per tulip bulb rather than you know, the you know, $2 that were normally the price of a tulip. And these bulbs, if it was a unique bulb, it became more and more popular and uh, people were buying them and selling them the next day at a 10 or 20% profit. Eventually, a rare tulip bulb sold for $200,000 in today's money. Uh, and so this was, this was called a bubble. And uh, even we've had stock market bubbles. It, it goes back to this experience because eventually nobody wanted to buy that bubble for that bulb for additional money and they wound up uh, going broke. So this was covered in the PBS series called The Miniaturist uh, that was on Channel 11 a couple of years ago. And uh, you, you could probably download it or get it from your library. It's a wonderful series because it covers Amsterdam as it existed in this time period. Uh, 1600s and 1700s, uh, that was very wealthy. Uh, they continued to be a major shipping power. Uh, uh, the Netherlands had wars with England and France, and uh, this was costly, uh, and they lost the war to England. But England, they, they, did, they created a peace process where they respected the Dutch, and the Dutch agreed to not threaten the English supremacy on sea, and they were largely able to get along. Uh, in more recent times, in the 1800s, the southern provinces of what was the United Nether 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 um, Netherlands decided they wanted to succeed from the, the country that was created in 1815. And the southern provinces were largely Catholic and felt uh, that they weren't getting the, the respect or the power positions. So they created a, a war of independence. And after 10 years, the, the, the northern provinces said, go ahead, just leave. Uh, and Belgium was formed as a parliamentary democracy. And they wanted to model themselves after England, where they had a figurehead king, but a, in a powerful parliament. And they selected as their king, uh, Prince Albert of Germany. And Prince Albert was the uncle of the uh, Queen Victoria's husband, Albert. And so in the PBS uh, show, Victoria and Albert, uh, that was prominently featured uh, Prince Albert and who he became the, uh, the king of Belgium. In the 20th century, uh, the Netherlands were neutral in World War I, and they were occupied by the German army in World War II. Uh, Belgium was devastated in both World War I and World War II. Great, uh, great destruction of property and loss of life. Uh, and the Netherlands, the biggest uh, trauma of World War II were, there was twofold. One is uh, 150,000 Jews were taken to death camps. 
and the Germans took a huge amount of food from the Netherlands, and eventually uh, thousands of people were starving to death by, towards the end of the war. Uh, uh, at the end of the war, towards the end of the war, there was a major battle in Arnhem where the British paratroopers tried to land to capture this bridge over the Rhine. And they ignored the advice of the underground, the local underground that said there were German tanks in the area. The British were so eager to land their paratroopers, they ignored that advice. They landed and the, uh, the troops were qu quickly captured or killed. Uh, and it was a major debacle. And it was covered in the movie, A Bridge Too Far, that uh, was a popular World War II movie. Uh, here we have Rembrandt. Uh, and uh, the picture on the upper left is Rembrandt, a self-portrait as a young man. In the lower left, it's Rembrandt as a older man and uh, clearly tried to pro project himself as he was and did not, uh, uh, you know, did not, you know, he tried to paint himself as, as he really existed, warts and all. Uh, in the upper right, you can see the, the same picture we talked about earlier of the night watch. And here you can see it in context of the size of the painting uh, that exists at the, uh, the Reichs Museum. And the picture that we see there is actually cut down from the size that Rembrandt initially painted because they wanted to fit it at some point, fit it into uh, uh, to a museum and they had to cut, uh, they had to cut three or four feet off the left or right side of the painting. Uh, Rembrandt uh, was the, uh, he was an amazing painter uh, throughout his life, highly successful, even though he had many economic ups and downs. Uh, but here is a painting of the prodigal son uh, that sits in the uh, museum at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And Rembrandt uh, was the only, from what, art, what I've learned from art historians, was one of the few uh, Reformation painters that was successfully selling biblical art. Uh, most of the painters were unsuccessful and gave it up, but here Rembrandt had uh, a number of uh, commissions for biblical art. And if you notice just the subtlety, you know, the, a painting like this uh, could be a whole hour lecture on its own. But, but one, one thing that's interesting with the painting here, if you look at the hands of the father uh, hugging his son, his left hand is the hand of a man, a big, strong hand. His right hand is the hand of a woman and showing that the compassion of, of that call for, for the father, it, it, it transcends gender. It is uh, you know, called to, call, call to be the loving parent uh, to, to this child. Uh, the beauty of Amsterdam met, uh, covers many, many aspects. But one is, what we see in Amsterdam today is exactly what Rembrandt saw 350 years ago. Uh, the picture here shows the, the second building in that group is the, build, is the apartment that Rembrandt lived in. And, and these are the exact same buildings and the exact same streets that existed when, that he saw. The only significant difference is uh, there were not lights on the bridges back then because they, they didn't know how to have electricity. So, but this is, it is the same town that Rembrandt saw, and it has, a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of canals. And in the historic Amsterdam, it's not just six or eight square blocks, it's 80 square blocks. It's just a huge central city that's identical to what Rembrandt saw. And, and here's a picture that shows the canals. And, uh, and much like Venice, uh, Amsterdam was built on swampy land, and they put in th uh, millions of wooden piles. You could think of these as tall telephone poles that they drove into the swamp, and then they built these large buildings on top of them, three and four story buildings on top of them. So even today, there are 1,700 bridges in Amsterdam. Just an amazing, beautiful uh, aspect but on the downside is there's a huge number of canals 
that have to be regularly uh, reinforced the canal walls. And uh, so it, it, right now they're in the middle of a, uh, renovating 100, 125 miles of canal walls. And uh, the current effort is a 20 year effort at two and a half billion dollars. And, and the reason that this is so important is if the canal wall fails, then the sidewalk that we see here with these guys walking on the sidewalk, that will fail and even that will expose the wooden piles supporting the buildings and they will fail as well. And so it's, so it's, it's really important that they stay on top of this to preserve their beautiful city. So here is the ship that we boarded. Uh, uh, Mary and I got to Amsterdam uh, three days early to do some sightseeing on our own. But the, we then boarded the Viking Geflon. And uh, it's a ship that had 180 passengers and a crew of 40. And, and this is not our ship. This was a ship that was passing us as we were sailing along. Uh, in each of the ships from all the many different cruise ship companies, they all have the exact same external dimensions. And that's because for them to, for the ships to go into the locks, they have a ship on the left and a ship on the right, and they have about, you know, 10 inches on each side of clearance. Uh, and then they have two ships in the front and then two ships in the back, all going into the locks. And with the ships raised uh, six feet or lowered six feet uh, as they move from one lock uh, to, uh, to, to, a to the next. Uh, with with a group with a size of passengers of this size, most people after a day or two, you've met other people that you like to hang out with. And here here are the people that we hung out with. So so Mary and I are on the left side, uh, and and on the left side closest to the to the the camera here, uh, is a, a husband and wife. She's a retired pastor of a Moldovian church in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Across from us is a uh, a, a retired Air Force colonel and his wife, and closer uh, on the the right side is Mike and his uh, wife Barb. Uh, he's a retired uh, art teacher at Louisiana State University, and he was our leader. So every day after we had a day of uh, tours, uh, we would gather for a lecture at uh, what was going to take place the next day. You know, so that that lecture was from like. 5 to 6 p.m. And shortly before it ended, Bob would go down and reserve, you know, grab a table for the eight of us to uh, have dinner together. So that, that was a, a wonderful group to hang out with. Uh, the first full day that we were on the uh, boat, uh, the, the Viking put us on smaller boats to take a tour of Amsterdam. And uh, here we are uh, on, a, on a canal boat tour. And, uh, and, and Amsterdam is a, a very interesting city, uh, but it was a city that became, the, its reason to exist was for trade. And here we see uh, eight buildings that in the 1700s, these were part of the, of the 1000 plus warehouses that existed within Amsterdam. And today they're uh, upscale apartments and offices, but Back in the 1700s and, uh, and earlier, these were warehouses. And if you, if you notice the building on the left, the, the uh, let me get back here, excuse me. The, the, the building on the left, the first building that you see the full size of the building. If you notice at the top of the building, there's something sticking out. And this looks like a railroad, uh, a, a rail rail from a railroad. And in the 1700s, and even today, they can put a pulley on that uh, piece of iron and they could pull the commodities, whether it was coffee beans or uh, spices, they could pull that from the, the land, uh, from the, the uh, sidewalk up to the second or third story for uh, for uh, access to the warehouse. And, uh, and even today, if you wanted to move a piano into the second or third store floor, you'd, you'd pull, use a pulley to lift it and uh, pull the piano through the window. Because these buildings are so narrow, 
the stair is going from one level to the other is very, very small. So you, you, you wouldn't be able to get a piano through the stairs very easily. Uh, and by the way, the, the boats that are on the water are actually uh, houses. People live in them and they have utility connections from the town and they pay a monthly rent besides paying for electricity and water. Uh, it was a wonderful canal tour. Uh, the picture on the left, there's actually bridge after bridge. There's actually seven bridges in that line of sight. Uh, and uh, on the right, we see more, uh, more bridges. It's a wonderful city. Bikes are everywhere. Uh, Amsterdam is even to, to this day a working international port. So, so boats can come in and drop their cargo off and be loaded onto small boats that we see here and send up the Rhine River and even to uh, reach the Black Sea. It's, it's one interconnected set of canals across Europe from the, from the Black Sea to the Atlantic. Uh, uh, Amsterdam, it's a city of bicycles. Very few people own automobiles. It's a hassle. They, they limit, unless you're a taxi, you, you, you're very limited on even what roads you can travel in the city. Most people take a bike or public transportation. And uh, the picture on the left, we see a, a woman with two children. She was probably out shopping for food and the food is uh, sitting in that, uh, on the bottom of that wooden platform that's part of the bike, and the kids are riding along. And notice the kids have seat belts on. So, so th this is part of the safety, uh, but people, rain or shine, people are using their bikes to get to work or to school or public transportation. Uh, the picture on the right shows, this is one of about five bike stations at the train station. So here there could be four or 5,000 bikes on these racks alone. And this is one of four such bike stations. So people could come in from other parts of the Netherlands to work uh, and uh, they come to the central train station, they hop on their bike and pedal to work or school and then return at the end of the day, put their, put their bike on the rack and head on a boat or on a train back home. Uh, Amsterdam is very walkable, uh, particularly the central areas, uh, and uh, the people enjoy wonderful beer. Uh, there's many, there's at least 30 wonderful museums in Amsterdam. Uh, the most famous ones are pictured here in the Rijks, uh, the Rijks, the Museum Plaza area. And so the, that large building in the center is the Rijks Museum. Uh, which has the, uh, their art and with including a lot of Rembrandts. There's a Van Gogh museum nearby. The Anne Frank house is also nearby. So, so many, many museums. Um, the next day we, we took our riverboat overnight. We traveled only 30 miles north of Amsterdam on a canal to the town of Horn. And this was until the 1930s Horn had a direct access to the North Sea and was an international trading port. port. Uh, so, uh, and this was one of the homes of the Dutch East Indies Company. And the Dutch East Indies Company was interesting. They were the first uh, international stock company. And it was created among the ship owners of the Netherlands because uh, the, the, these the ship owners, there might have been two or three hundred ships that they owned, and they'd send them to the Far East. But uh, if they if the ship came back, they had uh, like a thirty to one uh, return on their investment. But a third of the ships never came back. So if you owned one ship, if if it was lost, you were you lost all your investment. Where if it returned, you were very wealthy. So the ship owners decided, let's pool our resources and issue stock based on how many ships we add to the corporation and we share the risk and share the rewards. And so they became a stock company and then the British and French copied this whole logic. But uh, in the 1700s, this building that we see here was a warehouse for the Dutch East Indies Company in the city of Horn. And, uh, 
and today it's apartments. But in the 1930s, they they created a uh, they blocked the water by creating a dike that separated this town from the North Sea, and as a result, they picked up thousands of acres of farmland, and the salt water became fresh water for fishing. And uh, here we see a uh, in the center of town. Uh, this was part of the defensive perimeter for the city, but after they blocked, after they created the dikes, that was no longer needed. But they kept the round building as a uh, as a uh, uh, as a uh, a statement of this is what we had to do to protect ourselves uh, in the 1700s and 1800s. Uh, so what we see here is a picture. This is the Cheese Exchange Building. So. Uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, the farmers would bring, bring their cheese here. They, they would be graded uh, in terms of the quality, and then they could be put on ships going to other parts of Europe or around the world. And in the, seven, in the 1970s, this region had a population of about 30,000 people. However, until 1975, they still had separate schools and church, separate schools and hospitals, one set for Catholics, one set for Protestants, and one set for all others. And so it was only until 1975 that they said, why don't we just create one hospital system and one school system rather than having three separate systems based on religion? Uh, so, uh, so that that you know, 300 years of distrust took a while for that to dissipate, but, but it did. Uh, we took a couple tours that day, local tours. One was to a potato farm that had a, uh, that had a, uh, a windmill to, to create electricity. Uh, and then we also went to, to a farm that was a tulip farm. And, uh, and as part of the program with the, with the river cruise, uh, riverboat companies, the the host that would bring allow people to come and learn about their operation they had to have a little conference room or a little school room so that people could sit down have some coffee and and learn about their operation and so this woman was the wife of the farmer and she showed us uh, over coffee and cookies she gave us a little lecture on uh, how they grow tulips and then she took us out to the greenhouse and the warehouse where they processed tulips and prepared them for planting. So, so even though tulips are sold primarily in April and May, it's a year round effort to prepare them and to be ready for the tulip selling season. Uh, it was interesting, both this woman and the woman of the potato farm, they described themselves as, I'm the wife of the farmer. Uh, and I've given presentations out in farm areas and rural areas uh, and and the U.S. farming families, you know, the both uh, man and woman say I'm a farmer. Typically, they don't say I'm the wife of the farmer. But it both it was interesting. I thought both described themselves as the wife of the farmer. And 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 my only guess is because I couldn't really I didn't ask the question at the time is that the farmer is the captain of the ship. You know, there's one one leader and they're the farmer and everyone else is part of the team, but, but not the farmer, you know, uh, uh, that, that was my guess. Uh, but one of the interesting things is she explained how uh, on many nights, a, a, a large semi-tractor trailer truck will pull up to their farm and they'll load 10 or 15,000 tulips onto the truck. And the next morning, those tulips are, are auctioned off in Amsterdam at the tulip, at the flower auction. And here we see a picture. Notice all those, what look like green tulips uh, on plants. There's five or six or more trolleys and they might be auctioned off. And, and in Amsterdam at this auction, they apply what they call a Dutch auction. And normally for an auction in the US, the prices start low and then they go, people bid it higher and higher and higher. In a Dutch auction, it's just the opposite. They might begin at, you know, $3 a tulip bulb, and then every five seconds, they're lowering the price, you know, from three 
290, 280, 270. So if you wait long enough, you can get the, the tulip at much less price. However, there are 300 people sitting around this room and any time they can press a button and they buy the tulip at the current bid price. So if you if you delay too long, you'll wind up with no none at all. So so it it creates uh, it creates a a process, and the beauty of this process is they can sell those you know ten thousand tulips in the matter of you know each each auction takes about a minute because the price is going down and somebody will press the button so they they can sell a hundred thousand or more tulips in the course of uh, an hour or two it, it they can the process goes very quickly because everyone in this room knows i have to press the button sooner or later or i won't get any at all so it, you're you're trying to decide when, when to press the button um, the next day we were off now we had ent we'd gone from the netherlands to belgium and belgium uh, is we were we arrived at Antwerp, Belgium, and it's the second largest seaport in Europe, and uh, which was news to me. It, it was also the home to Peter Paul Rubens, uh, uh, the painter, and known for diamonds and chocolate. So uh, Antwerp uh, during World War II, when the when we had the D-Day landings. Uh, the leaders of the Allied forces would love to have Antwerp as a port to offload supplies uh, once they reach that far. It's only about 10 miles to the North Sea. However, they knew the Germans would destroy it and, and prevent the using the port. So, so the Allies had to come up with another way to resupply the troops after we landed in Normandy. Uh, here, the fella on the right was our tour guide from Viking and all our tour guides. We just had wonderful tour guides the whole time. The picture on the left is of the Duke's residence, the castle that the Duke of Antwerp lived in. Uh, and, uh, uh, but after a while he, you know, there was no longer a Duke. And uh, so this became a prison. And now they're trying to convert it back to uh, a castle, you know, to it looks like a castle and uh, they use it as a tourist destination. Uh, our guide also pointed out that on many of the buildings you saw a statue of the Virgin Mary and a blue light. And, uh, and he explained that in the 1800s, if you put such a statue and a blue light uh, uh, at your entrance, you had a 70% savings on your property taxes. So he said it became very, very popular to have uh, a statue and a blue light. Uh, he also took us to the, uh, the Cathedral of the Notre Dame, which is not the Paris Notre Dame, but the Antwerp Notre Dame. And uh, it's a huge cathedral and it showed Peter Paul Rubens's works. And one of the beauties of this is we saw this painting of Rubens and this is called Raising of the Cross. And uh, it's a, what they call a trifold painting that the two sides can fold up and uh, protect the uh, all three panels. And, uh, and we were standing, oh, maybe 12 feet from the actual painting. The painting was on a side altar and we were 12 feet uh, away from it. And what's the beauty is we were, we were looking at a painting that was created for this very spot on the church. Uh, so often when we go to the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, we, we see a wonderful painting, but we're not, we're not seeing the painting where it was designed, where it was designed to be held as, as when it was finished. And here we were actually at the spot that Rubens created this painting for. So that, that made it special. Uh, we also walked around the town and uh, there's our, our guide pointed out some wonderful chocolate, Belgium chocolate, and uh, he pointed out these, uh, the, the chocolate that came from specialty chocolate shops that use the freshest ingredients. Uh, and, uh, and so these are custom chocolates that are uh, really, he said, melt in your mouth, quite pricey. So it might be the equivalent of uh, $40 or $45 a pound, but he said, this is very special chocolate. Uh, Belgium also has Via, you know, somewhat mass-produced quality chocolate, 
And those are the type that Costco sells in November and December. So you can have wonderful Belgium chocolate uh, that's, that's uh, of, of very high quality, but it's not gonna match the quality of this custom, uh, these custom chocolate. Uh, on the next day, the ship, uh, our boat uh, took us to Ghent, which is a wonderful, beautiful medieval town. And, and Ghent was, uh, it, it's a town worth visiting in and of itself uh, because it, it survived from the Middle Ages quite nicely. However, we were there basically to dock and then we got on a bus that took us to the town of Bruges. And Bruges is a, a, an amazing medieval town. And, and, and here we see some of the painting, uh, some of the buildings that date back to the 1300s. And these were warehouses for international trade in the 14, 13 and 1400s. And uh, in, the, in Bruges, uh, in, the, in the 1400s, this was the, one of the largest cities in Europe. It, it, it uh, is equal in size to London uh, with about a population of 35,000 people. However, in the 1600s, uh, the access to the North Sea, there was a canal to the North Sea uh, that was about eight miles away. It, that canal silted up. So the larger ships could no longer get to Bruges. And so what was this amazing uh, trading center where, where ships from around the world would come that offload their cargo into warehouses like we saw here or, or as they existed in Amsterdam, and then it, it moved on smaller boats throughout the canal systems of Europe, that all froze in time. So these wonderful buildings were still sitting here, although the, the role of a distribution center had dissipated. Uh, so it was only in the late 1800s that the British travelers discovered the beauty of Bruges, and then it became a place that people from England and other parts of Europe you, if you were going to Europe, you had to stop in Bruges on the, as part of your trip. And uh, here, it, it, today, tourism is, uh, is a big part of their success. Uh, here is the, t uh, here's the town plaza, the major town square. And, and look at that building in the middle. It's a seven-story building with a bell tower, uh, with a clock and a bell tower. And in the Middle Ages, they built this. And, and you could say, well, there really was no need to have a seven-story building just to hold a bell tower. You could have, you could have had a three-story building with a bell tower. But, but you did it because you wanted to show the world that we are so successful, we can build a seven-story, we can pay for a seven-story building just to show how rich we are. And, and so it was, it was uh, th th that was kind of the logic. But, but here we have these amazing buildings that are still standing. Today, at one point, they were administrative buildings for the uh, international and the European commerce. And now they're museums and uh, offices. Uh, here, another part of the town square, again, back to the 1300s. Uh, picture on the left shows people sitting outside having, uh, 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 having a, a midday meal. Europeans love to sit outside. This was actually a cold day in the, the mid 40s. Uh, people are wearing winter jackets, but they want to be outside. They want to get the sun. Uh, Mary and I, we, we popped into a, a hot chocolate shop. And in uh, uh, the format is they gave you a cup of boiling milk. And uh, then, you, then you could pick which type of chocolate you have. And the chocolate's actually at the end of a little wooden stick. So. Mary there has a, uh, a milk chocolate uh, on the stick. I had a dark chocolate. So you swirl that around for a minute or so in the, in the, uh, in the steamy milk and you have, a, you have a wonderful hot chocolate. It was well worth the $10 per cup uh, because it was, we, it was nice and warm. If you notice, Mary has a winter jacket on plus a rain slicker trying to, uh, trying to stay warm. Uh, that, the afternoon, uh, after the tour had ended, uh, we, we wandered over to the cathedral, and this is the Church of Our Lady. And again, it was built in the 13th and 14th century. 
and, and built as a beautiful church, uh, uh, as a cathedral, uh, to show, again, to show off its wealth. And, uh, and they had a museum part that you pay to visit the art, and then they had the, the, the church part, which was free. Uh, and the, it's, again, both very beautiful. And one of the things that we wanted to see was th this paint, uh, this sculpture by Michelangelo, it's Madonna and Child. And this is a, a interesting, wonderful story. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, Michelangelo, at age 24, he received a commission from an Italian family and uh, to create a Madonna and Child. And so this is what he created. It's, it's about uh, 24 inches tall. And so he created this and you know, three or four months later, he brought it back to the family and they said, we don't want it after all, we're canceling the agreement. They said, in the, in the meantime, our nephew was elected Pope and we don't wanna deal with an unknown artist like you, we wanna go with a famous artist. So, so he, he, uh, he lost the commission. He took, I'm sure he took his statue away, quite disappointed. And uh, uh, somehow, you know, through different sales, it wound up here in Bruges. And during World War II, the German army came through. They took this statue as well as other works of art from, uh, uh, from churches or anywhere, in, uh, including many Jewish families. They took the artwork and in this case, they brought it to a mine in Austria uh, for storage. And towards the end of the war, uh, the US Army created a group of soldiers that were art historians, and they were chartered with trying to find where the looted art was. And they did find it in a, they, they heard the, there was a art stored at a mine in Austria. They went there, they, were, they, were, they found this and other works of art. And this was covered in the recent movie called The Monument Men. And, and part of the drama of the movie is the Russian army was only a day or two away coming to where the soldiers were recovering the art. So, so they had to get the art out of the way before the Russian army arrived. Otherwise, the Russian army would stop all activities. Uh, so and unfortunately, they were successful getting much of the art, not, certainly not all of it, but they got the statue out and eventually they got it back to Bruges. Uh, uh, you know, here our, our trip is winding down at this point. So, so day six and day seven are the really the last two days. Uh, in, in day six, we went to the, what they call the Kinderdijk region of the Netherlands. And here we have, uh, there are 19 windmills that date back to the 1700s. And, and again, the land here is six to nine feet below sea level. So, so the, the windmills were actually used to pump water. Not, not most, uh, there were some windmills used to grind corn, but most were used to pump water. So each of these 19 windmills operated in harmony with each other. So they, they would pump the water a, a half a foot or a, a per windmill until they were able to get it over the 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 dike that would that we don't see the dike in this picture the dike is on the left and so so the the windmills would pump the water and and allow that land to be dry and could be used for farming and uh, here we see uh, on the left you can see the date of this windmill it's 1736 this windmill was built and it's, and it's still working today so almost 300 years old, and we have a, a, a functioning windmill. Uh, the, uh, actually, the woman on the right in this picture is a, a windmill master, and, and she's pushing with her leg, this, uh, trying to turn this large wheel, which can change the direction of the windmill. If, if the wind is changing directions, you want you, 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 to optimize the functioning of the windmill you, you, you need to turn this wheel so that it can change the direction. Now, this particular windmill, uh, if it were operating, they would have cloth over these wood, you know, the wooden parts of the, of the sail. So right now, it's, uh, so the wind would just blow through this, but if they had the cloth over it, then the windmill would actually turn. And in the 1800s, 
there were 10,000 windmills across the Netherlands. And many times a family with 10 or 12 children lived in the windmill. And uh, there was very little living space. You know, this is all mechanical gears by and large inside the windmill. And so the living arrangements had to be very, very, uh, very, very difficult. But life was difficult at this time period. Uh, so having a steady job in a windmill was, was still viewed as a, a valuable thing. Uh, by the uh, by, the 1900s, the early 1900s, most of the water pumping role had been moved to electric pumps. So, so over a number of years, the 10,000 windmills dropped down to less than a thousand uh, that are there today. But today they're protected and preserved. So they want to keep these as a national treasure. Uh, and the next day, day seven, uh, we went to Zealand. Uh, and Zealand is an area right facing the North Sea in the southwest corner of the Netherlands. And, uh, and this picture on the right shows the, uh, what it's showing here, the land in white, the, the white parts of the map are, are actually land. And so we see on the left side, we see Groot Bretagne, so that's Great Britain. We see uh, Belgium in the middle, and uh, we see uh, France down below. And the area in red shows that if you have a, a storm uh, and high winds from the north, and you have a high tide, because the English Channel, it gets constricted as it moves south, the water that's pulsating from the north wants to overrun the land in this area. And uh, in 1953, there was a dike disaster that's shown here in this picture, and the water overran the dike. So the dike was very powerful, but the water ran over the top of the dike and corrupted the dike from the backside. And so 2,000 lives were lost. For many homes, they were the, the entire first floor was flooded, and even parts of the second floor. Uh, over 600 square miles of farmland was flooded. And in a disaster of this, not only is there loss of life in farmland, but, but it's very difficult to replace and repair a, a major dike break because the water is just rushing in. Uh, you could dump a, you know, a thousand truckloads of dirt and the water, the water will just wash it away. So what, uh, what the, the creativity of these people, they recalled that during World War II, the British and Americans created a series of large cement uh, uh, floating piers that were called uh, cr uh, cranberries. And these were used at the D-Day landing to create an artificial piers for, uh, to offload supplies after D-Day landing. So, uh, so the, the, the Netherlands government, they called the British and said, do you have any of those floating docks left? And the British said, yes, we have eight of them. We'll sell them to you. So they, they, sell, so they brought these dikes over from England. A couple sank on the way. They're, they're, they're floating docks, but if, but if they tip over the wrong way, they can, uh, they can sink. Uh, but they, what, what we see here is positioning four of these large floating concrete docks into position where they can be lowered uh, into the sea level to the floor of the uh, of the water and create a new barrier. And uh, this is exactly what they did. And the, this picture on the lower right, this is a picture of a picture. But what we see here are the four concrete blocks that they put into position. Then they added more dirt around them and clay and created. So this, what we're looking at here is a, is a dike system. And uh, you know, years ago, I thought a dike was a big, you know, uh, concrete wall that, uh, that, remember the story of the dike, the Dutch boy that put his finger in the dike and kept it from uh, uh, corrupting. Well, a dike, from the, their logic, a dike is typically, you know, uh, 30 feet tall and maybe 200 feet wide is what we see here. This is a typical dike that holds back the North Sea. And... Uh, there's even a road, our, the bus, when we came to visit this, our bus was riding on that road that we see as part of the dike. Now, 
these concrete blocks are huge. And here, here we have a picture of the concrete block. And uh, sometime 10 or 15 years ago, they created a, a museum at this very site. So what we're looking at here is the top part of that concrete block, and there's more to the block under land. And here we are walking inside the concrete block. And, uh, and here we have a museum that talks about that national disaster. And we spend 40 minutes wandering through the museum, and they bring school children here on a regular basis to talk about what took place and how it precarious it is uh, to, you know, what a, a tremendous force that water is in the North Sea and how they have to prepare uh, to live in such an environment. And, uh, and towards the end of the little museum, uh, they have this uh, picture, this uh, uh, display, and they explain to the children that you and your family have to have a three-day supply of food and water in your attic for you and the other people that live in the house. And maybe it's an apartment building. So there might be three families living in an apartment building. They all have to go to the attic and have food and water for three days. And then on day three, you can open up the window of your attic and wave a white flag. And then the, the, uh, the, police and firemen will know that you're inside and need to be rescued. But the message is you have to be prepared, first of all, and you can't call for help on day one or day two. It's day three that you can expect help. And that we, as people of the Netherlands, have to look after each other for those three days on our own, and then, then, then help will come. Uh, but the Netherlands did more than just wave the white flags they created a project called the Delta Project that, uh, that they, to try to manage the North Sea. So they spent three billion, $13 billion to create a series of these walls that can raise or lower. And if the storms in the North Sea are much higher, they can lower these walls all to, at one time and to protect the land and Venice is doing the same thing. Venice is, they, they follow this model, a different engineering version of it, but, but the logic is if there's a storm, you can raise a barrier that will keep out the, uh, the, the worst element of the storm. Uh, and they spend a billion dollars a year to maintain this. However, even with all of this, they worry that with global warming and with the rising sea levels, they might have to redo this in uh, 10 or 15 years to make it even taller because the water levels are rising uh, based on uh, some of the polar uh, uh, glaciers melting. So our final day was we were back in Amsterdam and we went to, we arrived uh, on buses to the Kuchenhof Tulip Festival. And this is the world's largest tulip festival. Uh, it, uh, it was amazing. And first of all, all week we were worried would the tulips be in bloom when we got to the festival. And our, our, uh, the crew of our ship, they were somewhat cagey. They kept saying, we hope they are in bloom, but we don't know for sure. Well, they did know they were in bloom, but they wanted to keep the suspense. Uh, so uh, this is a, the tulip festival takes place on a, uh, on a property that's about the size of the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Uh, I don't know how many exactly square acres it is, but, but if you ignore the botanic gardens, there's some parts of the botanic gardens that are basically an open field. Uh, if, uh, if you ignore that part, the, the, the Tulip Festival in Amsterdam was about the size of the rest of the botanic gardens. Wherever there's a building or real flowers or planting or, or water on the botanic garden, it's about an equal size. Uh, the, the whole festival has 7 million tulip bulbs. It's open only for six weeks, the season, and then it's closed the rest of the year. And the premier tulip growers take part and they send their tulips and their workers to plant the bulbs. It's a cooperative effort. And there, most of the plants are tulips, but there are some other flowers as well. Uh, everywhere you turn, it's just beautiful. Uh, the picture on the right is a Zen Buddhist uh, meditation building. Uh, 
the, the, those uh, the pictures on the left, those are not tulips. Uh, the, here is on uh, with myself as one of the uh, one of the hosts of the hostesses of the Tulip Festival. Uh, upwards of sixty thousand people a day come to the festival, and I believe it. There there had to be two hundred buses uh, in the parking lot. It just it just an enormous endeavor. And people from around the world are coming. Just beautiful colors everywhere you turn. Uh, you can buy tulip bulbs there. Uh, and uh, they, those are uh, a lot of photo opportunities on the right. Those are uh, cherry blossoms. Uh, the lady riding the bike, it's a stationary bike. It's a photo opportunity bike. It's not a, it doesn't really move. Uh, they have a couple indoor buildings where they show displays and uh, lessons on how to uh, how to display tulip bulbs and other flowers. Now you don't have to go to it's wonderful to go to Holland and uh, uh, and to Amsterdam, but in Holland, Michigan, uh, they have a tulip festival that up to five hundred thousand people a year go to. So this year it's on May sixth. Uh, to the 14th, and it's their 94th Tulip Festival. So the year before Mary and I went uh, on this cruise, in 19, uh, so that was in 2019, in 2018, we went to Holland, Michigan for their Tulip Festival. And it, it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, when we were in the, uh, so when we were in Amsterdam, their festival begins at the end of March where in Holland, Michigan, it's the beginning of May. So, so the tulips are blooming in uh, Amsterdam at least a month earlier than in Holland, Michigan. Now, uh, this presentation and all the ones I'm giving this year are really in honor of Mary. Uh, we lost Mary a year ago to a, a rare muscle condition. Uh, so Mary and I were married uh, 19 years. We did many, many travels to Europe. And, uh, and her message has always been travel while you can, enjoy the world. We, we enjoyed many trips to Europe uh, and with a focus on classical music uh, and culture. Uh, so travel to Europe, pack light and have a good pair of shoes were, was her constant message, but, but enjoy it. And if you're retired, spend three weeks there. Don't, if you're working, oftentimes you only have a week or two for vacation, but if you're retired, go for three weeks, uh, which is what we did as, as often as we can. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to see, are there, are there any questions or comments uh, from the participants? So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to click on the Q&A section here. Uh, the, uh, so, okay, here's a question from Jackson. It said, how does the farmland allow for the saline saturation and uh, still remain fertile? Okay, so, uh, so saline is, is, I think, that's salt. So, so I think, by and large, in, in the Netherlands, they want to keep the salt water uh, in the North Sea so that the water that's coming from rain uh, onto the land that's fresh water. So, so, so they, they really pump that water out and put it into the, to the canals that go to the North Sea. So, so the, the saline saturation should not be a problem where they did block off the land in that city of Horn. When they, when they, when they, when they, when they created a dike that, that closed off that area to the North Sea, that water was salt water. But over 10 or 15 years, it became fresh water. So the, the, the salt for somehow dissipated, and I'm not sure exactly how, but that was, uh, uh, but that is now fresh water uh, once they put the dike in. Uh, so, I, uh, so another question from Jackson, do any of the areas experience regular flooding like uh, that occurs in Venice? In, in my understanding is that it, they do not, that they've been able to, uh, that the dikes that they have keep the, the North Sea and the salt water 
out uh, away from the land. Uh, and with the exception of that massive uh, dike break in 1956, they've done that successfully. And uh, the, the Netherlands take water very, very seriously after uh, the, uh, the Katrina uh, in uh, New Orleans, they came over and gave some advice to the Army Corps of Engineers. I think by and large, we ignored their advice, but, but, they, uh, but they, uh, you know, they're, they, they've been very, very successful in water management. Uh, another question, um, what is the story and history of the wooden clocks? Okay, great question. So I think the wooden clogs go back to the fact that the land was wet historically. So wooden clogs gave some uh, protection for your feet. And while we were in Holland, Michigan during that Tulip Festival, uh, they have uh, uh, they have uh, high school students doing the dancing in the wooden clocks. And, uh, and we were at one rehearsal because we, we were there a day before the festival originally began. And we, so we went to the uh, rehearsal of the dance of the wooden clog dancing in the streets around the square. And there, and there had to be four or 500 high school students uh, dancing uh, and maybe some others besides the high school students. But we talked to this one woman and she said when she, so she was the grandmother of one of the high school students that was in rehearsal and she said when she was in high school, she, she did the clog dancing. When her daughter uh, was in high school, she was in, uh, uh, did the clog dancing. And now, now the, uh, the, her granddaughter, so three generations of this one family were involved with the Holland, Michigan clog dancing. Uh, so, okay, another message uh, from uh, Linda. So sorry for your loss. I love Belgium and Holland. So that, that, uh, uh, so thank you for that, uh, your condolences. Uh, okay, a good a question from Judy. Do they need to fertilize soil for the tulips? Uh, I suspect they do, but uh, uh, I don't recall the answer from the, uh, the, the, uh, the little lecture that we had. Uh, if they, I, I suspect they do have to do some kind of fertilizing. Um, one thing I did not mention uh, that for the Netherlands, they do a huge amount of growing of uh, fruit and vegetables indoors. In, uh, uh, so, so they have uh, using LED lights and using the uh, solar power that they have. Uh, they do lots of farming indoors now and uh, to, to make sure that they can grow enough food year round. So they, they're uh, so th this is coming to the U.S. I mean, we have an enormous amount of, of farmland in the U.S. So they, they have much less, less land to farm. So they, they've moved to indoor farming as a, as a major source of their uh, agriculture and uh, other parts of the world is adopting that same logic. <clears throat> they, uh, so here's another question. They plant grasses that can take up the saline and help remove it so that the plants begin to grow. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, the, so that's a thank you for that answer uh, that uh, update. The um, the freshwater lake made by the dike system was in the South Sea, so they may have done that in the South Sea, but it was also done in the uh, in the North Sea around the town of Horn, according according to our tour guide when we were there. So I think those are all the questions. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, I enjoyed uh, a, a, a return visit to the uh, Geographic Society. I think, uh, Julie, I think you had some closing comments that you wanted to make. Yes, I did. Jean, thank you so much for such a thorough presentation. Again, sorry about your loss, but that was a great presentation in her memory. Um, I just want to say, mark your calendars, everyone, for next month's travel log on March 21st at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, our present presenters will be Linda Minert and Judy Bach, who will be presenting on RVing to Glacier National, Glacier National Park. And thank you, everyone, again, for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. Okay. Take care, everyone. Until next time.
Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Julie.